this episode of Out of Country. Out of Country is a leadership series where I get to sit down one-on-one -on -one with people who are doing amazing, inspiring, volunteer and philanthropic work in other countries. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Laverne Bisky and David Zadek of No Ordinary Journey Foundation. Welcome, David. Welcome, Laverne. Thank, thank you, you very much. Sir. And thank you so much for doing this because this couple is very hard to get a hold of. In fact, I think you just came back from Vietnam, what, a week ago, I'm thinking? Yeah, and plus I had to renew my passport because it's three and a half years old and it every page was full except for one. So <laughs> I guess that tells a tale, right? You need to have, eventually the passport should have an extension page where all the... Yeah. An extension booklet. <laughs> yes, yeah. extension booklet. So how long has your charity, No Ordinary Journey Foundation, been in existence? Well, we, we officially started in 2012, um, but then we did our first actual project in 2013, which was really more of a um, reconnaissance mission that we did to Vietnam, myself and Dave and our daughter, Ksenia. And it, we spent six weeks there and it kind of laid the ground for future work. Um, and then of course the first, uh, let's say, professional mission, which you were on, yes. happened in 2014. <laughs> so we've been around a while already. Yes. And I should say that you are the CEO and founder of No Ordinary Journey, but David being your partner, life partner, also probably plays a very big role. Yeah, I think I think Dave has played a very big role in a, in a number of ways. Um, in the beginning when we did that first reconnaissance mission in 2013, of course he was a huge part of that, of helping me see where the needs were. And we brought our daughter Ksenia, who you know is a wheelchair user, yes. and so that was a very onerous thing to spend six weeks in Vietnam and to go from one end of the country to the other. And so Dave was very helpful in um, supporting both Ksenia and I in that way. But then once we kind of got rolling, he's, he was a very important part of keeping the home fires burning, mm, you know, and supporting me when things were really rough because there have been patches that have been very challenging in terms of trying to get the permissions to do the work that we want to do yes. in Vietnam. So he's been, he's been great. He's been very helpful. And we just actually did um, a mission, although I want to emphasize that these are not in any way religious because that's really important. Um, yes. Working in countries in Vietnam that do not formally allow religious missions. That when I say mission, I mean we're doing a trip but to me, trip doesn't completely capture it, hey? It, what would you say? Mission, uh, I think project might be a better word because, uh, because they are projects to help people. And at the same time, it's, yeah, like you say, it's, it's not missionary work. It's, uh, it's really helping people to hopefully progress forward, giving them the tools so that Again, we're, No Ordinary Journey is not going to be around forever, and we had never intended to be around forever. What? <laughs> <laughs> Our objective is basically give the people the training, give them the tools so that we can move on to somewhere else so that yes. they have the skills. Yeah. Sure. And I think that's, that's the key is, is to have exit strategies coming out of, uh, well, Vietnam and uh, hopefully now uh, with uh, what you call it, Thailand and Cambodia and possibly Laos, you know, wow. on the offing. That's a great idea. I was just talking about exit strategies just yesterday with my wife mm. uh, when dealing with, <laughs> oh, with no. companies. You might have to clarify no, no. You that. Nothing about relationships, exit, but about starting a company. What is the, perp the main purpose of No Ordinary Journey Foundation? So really there is only one purpose and um, when people ask me about what the purpose is, I usually say very simply that it is to bring hope and dignity to children living with cerebral palsy in Southeast Asia and hopefully in, in other countries. 
Uh, we do that in many different ways, largely education related, but we have done wheelchair projects. Uh, we have brought medications. I have a story for you about that. Yes, I remember um, that. You know, we, we have done it in a number of different ways, but I think our goal and our intent is always simply just to do what we can to bring hope and dignity to these children mm -hmm. living with the very same disability that our own daughter has. How did the name come about? I'm always interested in asking people about uh, the, the charity names. Mm -hmm. How did it come about? Was it an epiphany? Did it just happen? The whole, the whole idea started off in 2008 when we took our kids out of school um, and took them to actually traveling through Southeast Asia, starting in China uh, and China, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos okay. for five months. And at the beginning, why we said we should put together a website of some kind or a blog, and we we're looking for a name. And we we're taking my daughter along, who is number one, uses a wheelchair. So I mean, that, that was already. A bit of an if she's also a type 1 diabetic we are figuring right. out all of these various things and this is what sort of the, the name developed we we're sitting around brainstorming and we said this is not like any other journey that any other family that would be doing and exactly the name sort of sort of uh, developed from that and As actually it was Devin's idea yeah, actually it was Devin. our son Devin he said, well, it's pretty obvious this is no ordinary family, no ordinary life, and no ordinary journey. Yes. And so because um, the foundation grew out of our family's deeply personal experiences in those sure. countries, we just decided to, to adopt that. The project that you just came back from, um, tell us about that. That was quite a few wheelchairs. Delivery. Yeah, and again, you know, I think the important thing um, about any of these projects that we do, it, it's never about wheelchairs, it's never about um, equipment or furniture or tools or medications or anything like that. Um, I mean, those are part of it, of course, but it's really about training. And like Dave said, it's really about helping people in those countries that we're working in to have the skills to be able to do those things themselves. So this particular project that we just came back from, Dave was involved in that. So he was involved with um, a big project that you were on as well, um, yes. a conference that we did in 2015 in, in Vietnam. And now this most recent project Dave was part of, so that was, that was pretty special because he's a teacher. So when we're doing training, sure. He's a perfect guy to have along. But sure. what we were doing is we were actually training physiotherapists on how to provide these wheelchairs to kids with mm -hmm. CP. Because, um, you know, you might be familiar with the wheelchairs that you see at the airport or you see at the hospital that basically any adult can sit in and can be wheeled around in. But for kids with cerebral palsy, Sitting is a particularly big challenge. It's not just about moving them from one place to another. It's really about seating them comfortably and not making their condition worse because mm. they're sitting in a position that's going to give them scoliosis or, you know, even have them fall out of the wheelchair or something like that. Yeah. Yes, yes. I think I did see a few of the Facebook pictures of yeah. Dave uh, sitting uh, on the floor assembling a wheelchair showing yeah. all the therapists and i think that it's it's more than just the assembly it's it you know for any wheelchair that you're going to provide for a child it's with cerebral palsy it's a, basically a three-part process number one you have to get the child in there and measure them up figure and mm -hmm. figure out what your particular problems you're dealing with once you've got that then you can come back and say okay now we're going to take this chair and uh, the chairs that were provided by this Australian uh, uh, foundation. Organization. Yeah. Yeah. Organization. Wheelchairs uh, for kids. And it was like about, I remember the number, 166, 166 wheelchairs. wheelchairs. So that is amazing. Then you have to build the chair to fit the kid. And these yes. chairs were amazing. Truly amazing. Uh, they are, I, I take my hat off to the designers. These things were, you could change the, the fittings, the size, the seat depth, the height depth, the width of the chair. Um, where the wheels were located uh, and all you needed was 
two, two uh, 10 millimeter socket, a 19 millimeter socket, and a Phillips screwdriver. Almost an Ikea brand. Oh. Almost, oh. Almost an one Ikea Allen key. The, the, the Ikea, the so, Ikea yeah, wheelchairs. It really was. Wow. And you know, but there's another hour and a half by the time you get it all built. Then you need to bring the child back and actually fit them in there and put in all the laterals, wow. do all those things. Final There's another you know, final adjustment. There's another hour and a half. So it's not just taking the child and going, plunk, here's your wheelchair. No, yeah. it's about a five, six hour process for every child by the time you go through the first one, by the time you get a bill, by the time you get it, actually get the child in there yes. and then ready for them to go home. So I think another thing about this project that we just completed that was very, very gratifying is the fact that we are working with the Australian organizations uh, organization called Wheelchairs for Kids. And it was a beautiful partnership because like Dave said, they designed and they distribute these wonderful wheelchairs. But there's got to be someone in the receiving country that has the knowledge and information of how to do this elaborate process. And then mm -hmm. he hasn't even talked about there's, there's a follow-up process that needs to happen because of course kids grow and change and the wheelchair needs to I be see a subject matter expert. Yeah. <laughs> it's to have people trained on the ground so that like we were mm -hmm. talking about exit strat strategies, you know, once you have the people on the ground and you know you've done the follow-up, you know that they're competent and everything else in dealing with these children and growing the chairs, we can basically stand out of the picture and allow the sure. the, the, chair, the charity out of Australia to send them to them directly. Exactly. Sure. So we train great. we trained people in four locations, and um, now, as Dave said, those wheelchairs can just go to those locations. They don't they don't need us to be there. Those okay. people are trained, and the whole project carries on beautifully. That's great. So, so yeah. the countries that you try and focus on are like the. Uh, uh, the, the countries like you mentioned, Vietnam, Thailand. We started in Vietnam because we had some experiences there that so we had some opportunities when we were traveling with our kids to mm -hmm. really get into some communities and to really see what kids like our daughter were experiencing. Mm -hmm. So they kind of tugged at our heartstrings. And then once that was in place, because a lot of our work has been funded by Rotary, they've been a fantastic support to us, not only financially, but, you know, using their wisdom and their mm -hmm. connections. Um, a couple people in particular, Walter Hazel, I think you know, yes. has really gone above and beyond to... Uh, to help us make all of these things successful, but that also, that connection also catapulted us into the work that we have done in Thailand. Nice. Um, and now um, we're reaching out and hopefully we'll have the opportunity to do something in Cambodia and in Laos. So they're all kind of in the same region nice. and sometimes it's easier to build That's good. within a region. And so. the country Vietnam was quite open to, yes. to allowing you mm -hmm. to come in and do that kind of work. It's humanitarian work. And also, I think you have a very good uh, volunteer staff as well, not just from yeah, I, Canada here where we are based in Western Canada, but also there in Vietnam. Yeah, and I, I think that that cannot be overemphasized how important that is, because if you think back to the first mission, um, when you think back to the first project, project. <laughs> I think you can't <clears throat> overemphasize the importance of having very strong team of volunteers, both locally and our international volunteers. So the very first project that you were on, you'll remember that there was not only volunteers, our core little group from Canada, mm -hmm. but we had Australians and we had Europeans. And all of us from abroad were supported by generally volunteer translators yes. within Vietnam. Yes. And the important thing about that is that, and I guess I hadn't really thought about this at the time, about the importance of having those Vietnamese volunteers acting as um, interpreters and translators. But many of those students were medical students and I realized after by some of the emails that I got the impact that it was having on them mm -hmm. and how it was changing their view 
of disability mm -hmm. and their view of cerebral palsy. And it was, it's just a very wonderful thing to watch these students coming, acting as volunteers for us, yes. and then seeing their lives being changed and imagining all the people that they are going to touch in their future yes. careers. Yeah, that's you fantastic. Know? It really, really is. And they're amazing. all starting their careers off. Mm -hmm. So do you have any kind of memorable, funny uh, moments were they um, perhaps challenging? Well, I think that it's always a big surprise of how over the top successful every project has been. And I mm -hmm. think it's that we have the right combination of overseas volunteers and local volunteers and yeah. enthusiasm from the people that are being trained. There are a number of really big challenges that we've encountered and some of them um, I would be reluctant to tell you about when we're being filmed mm -hmm. and I, I think it's actually an important point because when you're when you're going to try and change attitudes um, about for example, children with disabilities. disabilities, you brush up against the edges <clears> and <throat> you brush up against things that would not be considered acceptable in our country. So there have been many, many challenging things mm -hmm. um, that we've witnessed. Mm -hmm. One thing though that was very interesting that I can tell you about because I think it sheds a little bit of insight into the kind of environment that we're working in. Uh, Vietnam is still a communist country, although it's obviously opening up economically um, a lot. The Vietnamese are very, very entrepreneurial and, and open. Um, but there was one project that we did was, that was a training project. And um, we also distributed some wheelchairs, although that wasn't the main part of the project. And while we were doing our work and doing our training, uh, one of our Vietnamese Canadian volunteers came to me and he said, the police are here and they would like to talk to you. Oh. <laughs> and I was a little bit taken aback because that's, you know, not something, you're not working away in Canada and the police exactly. come here or, you know, if they do, so it's a really big problem. Big it's not a routine thing, right? <laughs> And so I thought about it for a minute and I said, well, please invite them in and ask them to tell them they are welcome to come and see what they're, what we are doing sure, yeah. and determine if there's a problem yeah. or anything that needs to happen. Yeah. And he went and talked to them and he came back and he said, what they actually want is they want a list of all the children who are receiving wheelchairs. Now, of oh. course, they never did come in to see what we were wow. doing. They just asked for that list. And I okay. said, I I'm sorry, I can't provide that. Like if the hospital provides that, sure. that's within your system. Yeah. Is that supposed to be like a taxable benefit or something? Well, like in our country? <laughs> yeah. And truly, we really don't know what they did mm. with that information. Although we do know because we had some student volunteers go back and visit those families that they still had the wheelchairs and the wheelchairs were in use and everything seemed to be fine. Mm. But it kind of tells you that you're, or reminds you maybe that you're working in a different system and you always have to be cognizant of the cultural and political sure. situation yeah. and even language situation because I am, I'm sure I have offended many people yes. on many occasions. People always ask me if I speak Vietnamese because I've been there 15 times. Quite a few times. Yes, yeah, that, that was times. one of my questions. Was yeah. how many? Yeah, I think, I think it's 15 wow. now and um, I I really, really, really try hard not to speak Vietnamese. My hearing is very poor. It's a tonal language and I hear the words wrong. And two words that sound exactly the same to me can have very, very different meanings. And uh, yes, I yes. have offended people in the past, <laughs> not meaning to, and they usually it's, understand. It's a, it's a very complex language. So what's the, uh, what's the next? Is there another project coming up? There in is. The near future? Yeah. For, for uh, we are waiting for final grant approval to do a three week therapist training project in Northern Thailand. We did one at the beginning of 2008. Team. 
Okay. 2018. 2018. I'm only a decade behind. Yeah. And Dave will tell you, I don't know where I am most of the time, so it's amazing <laughs> these things all work out okay. one way or another. But we um, we do have we almost everything in place to do a project in Northern Thailand in the beginning of next year. Nice. Yeah. The one that Good. we did in uh, 2018, there was a bit of a delay because um, it was reviewed by a pediatrician, a Thai pediatrician afterward, just to look at the efficacy and the mm. value of what we were doing because we're you know, bringing a different model into their system. And um, after he reviewed it and sent us his report, we were very thrilled with the report because the report said that our training should happen in every province in Thailand. So pretty much I have work for the rest of my life as long as I can sort of come up with the funding. And we will, um, you know, we're in the process of thinking about, again, that exit strategy that Dave mentioned. How can we do this more efficiently? How can we reach more people? Mm -hmm. And how can we sort of pass that training along so that they're training each other the instead knowledge. of that? Well, one of the things I learned when I went on that mission was that, uh, you know, we, we had the pre uh, the pre-game show amongst all of us, the presenters. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was the fly in the wall behind the camera, but the pre presenters were getting all their their uh, their content and their material mm -hmm. ready. And when the show starts, the, there might be a few hiccups, but I think everybody just ran on it well. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that I learned about leadership is like watching you. You were in the back of the room most of the time, and you just <laughs> you just let your team just run with it, yeah. which I thought is a really good thing to do because you can plan all you want but it's just a plan well right? and i what were you going to say <laughs> dave can add something to that dave can add something to that but i think what i was going to say is why i'm in the back of the room is because i i act as project manager but really i'm not a subject matter expert i have 20 years 24 years mm -hmm. next week of hands-on experience with as the daughter, parent the of a same. child yes yeah of a, as the parent of a child with cerebral palsy but i don't have any formal training so that was one of the very first things that i figured out when i had the idea to do this is that it's going to fly on the abilities of the people that I can of attract an interest in doing this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why all of our projects have far exceeded um, my expectations in terms of, you know, what we're measuring for, sure. for success. You have the right subject matter experts on board. Yeah, exactly team. right. Like, like the firm, even prior to this, you know, had been uh, working with a cerebral palsy organization here and had done the organizational work and it's even even on an individual project there's like it says there's always little hiccups right uh, you know yes. sometimes i usually end up being the gopher running around but she's <laughs> the one who has to put out the fires right. and you know put put things get keep things running in order and you know you go on one of these projects and every evening you know you come back at the end of the day and it's sort of decompress number one and figure out okay what, what are we going to do you know, tomorrow what, what, <laughs> what things all work today with you know here's the yes. plan we had for tomorrow what things need to get modified for tomorrow and you know again you're always there's it's it's never smooth it's right. kind of right. a flow which is kind of nice in a way yes. because it it adds a little bit of uh, skill to, yeah. to, to your... That's some exciting. It's nice. <laughs> it's nice, but I also think it is one of the reasons why we have been so successful is the fact that we have not come in with um, a pattern or a curriculum that we just throw on top of the local situation. Mm -hmm. We're always bending and melding and fitting things to the circumstances that we come to because mm -hmm. like you said when we did the conference in 2015 we had our little scrum and we had a bit of a game plan but you have to go there with a lot of flexibility because you're you're literally going to the other side of the world right. and you're yes. encountering people who might see things completely differently and that's why we've been so successful because we've been able to roll with it. Yes. And sometimes you get there okay. and there are resources or people or situations that 
we've seen this, that work perfectly into your plan, but you have to be open mm -hmm. to, to pulling them into the fold. Sure. And you also have to be really good at crisis management. I'm really good well, at crisis management. She's very good at crisis management. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other half of it, right? And something that I learned is just smile. No one will ever know the difference. Yeah, that's right. right. Well, that sounds so great. I'd love to chat more, but I, I didn't want to go too long. I just wanted to introduce our viewers to uh, your charity. I think yeah. it's a, a fantastic charity. Uh, the two missions I went on, I certainly learned a lot about uh, teamwork, about leadership, about planning, and also about uh, about how like giving back to other countries that can really benefit from our expertise here. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Laverne and Dave. And thank you to all of you, whoever you may be watching this episode. The charity I've been talking about with Laverne and Dave is No Ordinary Journey Foundation. They have uh, had this charity now since 2014. Many trips to Vietnam and uh, coming up, one coming up uh, again in Thailand because you were there already. So thank you so much for sitting down with us and telling us, sharing, You're very and, welcome. and thank you to all of you. Stay tuned for the next episode of Out of Country. <laughs>